Why the famous Saw 9 has such a low rating? I think you should have the answer after watching the previous 7 series of masterpieces. If we were to analyze Saw 9 as a standalone film, it could be considered a decent thriller. However, when compared to the earlier films in the series, the quality gap resulted in a significant drop in its rating. Now, let's delve into the storyline of Saw 9. A man wakes up from a coma to find himself tied up. His tongue caught in a mechanical device that prevents him from moving or calling for help. What's worse is that Marv is hanging from the underground tracks. A situation that has left Marv stupefied. Before Marv could figure out what was going on, the kidnappers appeared on the TV wearing pig masks. Marv, a police officer who had falsely accused others and sent them to prison, was kidnapped and brought here to face a game punishment. In order to survive, he must trade his freedom for his own tongue. Marv managed to break free from the thorny ropes that bound him, but now his tongue was clamped down, rendering him motionless. The internal struggle within Marv was intense as he contemplated the cost of losing his tongue to escape from this place. Before Marv could make a decision, a swiftly approaching train left him with no more opportunities. By the time Marv chose to kick away the supporting object beneath his feet, it was already too late, and he was instantly shattered upon impact. Detective Zeke, who received the alert, arrived at the scene with rookie Detective William to investigate. The gruesome sight of the victim almost made William vomit. As the man had been shattered into pieces and was unrecognizable, the police cannot confirm the identity of the deceased or determine whether the man committed suicide or was murdered. Back at the station, Zeke and the team were still unsure of the situation when a mysterious person sent them a package. Inside the package was a USB drive containing a video recorded by the mysterious person. I'm here to help reform the Metro Police, to remind them of their oath to the people of this city. One officer from your station. The warning message in the video left the officers bewildered. The swirling patterns inside reminded them of Jigsaw, the murderer of the famous Chamber of Secrets. The address on the wall with the vortex pattern led them to the location. Zeke and the officers rushed to the location, where they found another package left by the mysterious person. Upon opening it, they discovered a severed tongue and a police badge. Through examination, they determined that the severed tongue belonged to the victim Marv from the subway. Marv's identity was confirmed to be that of a fellow police officer in their department and also one of Zeke's few good friends. Captain Angie instructed Zeke to investigate the matter thoroughly and find out who was responsible. By reviewing the surveillance cameras near the subway station, they discovered that Marv was tracking a thief at the time. Once Marv cornered the thief, he disappeared without a trace. Officer Fitch, who was reviewing the footage, immediately recognized the thief as a drug dealer he was familiar with. Although Zeke was in charge of the case, Fitch, who had a history of problems with him, didn't want to report it to him. Fitch arrived alone at the hideout of the drug dealer, but he found no trace of the dealer there. As Fitch was about to leave, a kidnapper wearing a pig mask suddenly appeared and abducted him. When Fitch regained consciousness, he discovered that he had been fitted with an iron head cage, and his ten fingers were trapped in wire mesh making it impossible to remove them. Before he could fully comprehend the situation, a television screen on the side displayed the image of a kidnapper wearing a pig mask. I want to play a game. Hello, Detective Fitch. It turned out that years ago, Fitch, in the line of duty, had impulsively shot and killed an innocent driver who had spoken disrespectfully to him. Now he was about to face the punishment of a game. The water level in the sink would rise to the level of a copper wire 90 seconds after flowing through the pipes. If Fitch couldn't free his hands from the wire mesh before that, he would be electrocuted to death. To survive, Fitch had to bite down on the switch on his mouth to activate the motor device. The pulling force of the motor would directly sever his fingers. In order to survive, Constable Fitch had to do what he was told. However, despite enduring excruciating pain from the severed fingers, Fitch didn't manage to escape within the 90 seconds, and the electric current struck him, causing instant death. Soon, the police received another package sent by the killer, containing a video with a message that urged the police department to reform and reflect. The police immediately rushed to the location where the video was recorded. Inside a car adorned with a vortex pattern, they found another package with severed fingers and a police badge. The badge number confirmed it belonged to Detective Fitch. Fitch's accident reminds Zeke of an accident that happened back in the day. At that time, Zeke had requested backup while pursuing a criminal. But Fitch, who was nearby, ignored his call for help. As a result, Zeke was shot and nearly died during the chase. Zeke's father, Marcus, who was the head of the department, saw his son repeatedly requesting assistance without anyone coming to his aid. He vowed to hold those responsible accountable. Fitch couldn't hide his guilt. 
and Marcus immediately sensed it. Marcus confronted Fitch and began to pummel him until other officers intervened and stopped him. If it wasn't for the other officers stopping Marcus in time, Fitch would have been dead by then. This incident further fueled the animosity between Fitch and Zeke. Officer William expressed his doubts about the case, questioning why the killer only sent packages to Zeke and not to others. Maybe the murderer is Zeke's enemy. Following this lead, Zeke took William to a church where he found his former partner, Peter. Years ago, Zeke's partner, Peter, had covered up the misconduct of another officer by directly killing a witness and making it appear as an assault on the police. However, Zeke exposed Peter's actions, leading to his imprisonment. Now, Peter had fallen into working at the church. Zeke suspected that this case might be connected to Peter, but Peter denied any involvement. Without evidence, Zeke had no choice but to leave with William. The next day, to Zeke's surprise, the killer sent another package, this time containing human skin. Inside the package, there was a note with a warning message that Zeke couldn't fully comprehend, and on the skin they found a tattoo. Zeke was instantly reminded of his new partner, William. William's murder was too much for them to believe. Soon after, they received an alert and found a skinned body at a slaughterhouse. It's a gruesome sight that leaves Zeke silent. The recording left by the killer confirmed that the victim was indeed Zeke's new partner, William. Meanwhile, Captain Angie at the police station received a text message from former Captain Marcus, Zeke's father who suspected a connection between this case and a certain case file. To understand the situation better, Angie decided to investigate in the archives. Meanwhile, outside, several police officers were being attacked by individuals wearing pig masks, but they were not being abducted. Zeke was puzzled about the killer's intentions until he remembered the warning message on the note. More bodies to drop. I'll take your head. Angie, get ahead of the department. Angie. It dawned on Zeke that the killer's current target was their captain, Angie. When Zeke called Angie, he couldn't reach her. Even the phone lines at the station were jammed and inaccessible. Angie came to the basement of the police station to investigate the case. Not knowing that she was in danger, a dummy with a pig's head mask scared Angie and she drew her gun. The door behind her closes, and it's too late for Angie to get out. Soon after, a smoke bomb was thrown into the archive room, filling it with thick smoke. The phone lines had already been cut. The overwhelming smoke caused Angie to lose consciousness. When she woke up, she found herself bound, with a white cloth covering her face. <laughs> Angie felt around and discovered that the kidnapper had left her a recording. As the captain of the police station, Angie is now being punished by the game for covering up corruption in the department. The pipe above her would release scalding hot wax and the only way to escape was to use the blade behind her neck to sever her spinal cord. The hot wax began pouring onto Angie's body. On the other side, Zeke had returned to the police station to search for Angie. The officers at the station were busy handling various emergency calls. Unaware that the killer was deliberately diverting their attention, Zeke learned from one of the officers that Angie had gone to the basement archives. When Zeke arrived at the archive room to check on Angie, he discovered that she had already been suffocated by the hot wax. Leaving her breathless and lifeless, Zeke suspected that this was likely the work of someone within the police force. He immediately decided to lock down the police station. By reviewing the surveillance footage from the archive room, they found that someone had tampered with the recordings during that time. Such an operation required access to the police station's security system. In other words, they could track down who was responsible by examining the login records for that day. Strangely, they found Zeke's former partner Peter's name in the login records. The officers were puzzled because Peter had been dismissed years ago due to past incidents. So how could he still have login privileges? To uncover the truth, Zeke went to the church to find Peter. However, upon arrival, Zeke was abducted by a person wearing a pig mask. When Zeke regained consciousness, his hands were already shackled. Help! The captor had left a saw on the floor but using it to saw through the shackles seemed impractical. Zeke noticed a hairpin on the ground, and with its help, he successfully opened the handcuffs on his hands. It was then that Zeke discovered Peter, his former partner, also bound in the room. He quickly woke up Peter, who was unconscious. At first, Zeke thought that Peter was behind the events at the station, but his perception changed when he found a recording on Peter's person. The recording contained the voice of the kidnapper revealing that Peter was also being punished in the game for killing a witness years ago. Peter's only hope of survival lay with Zeke. Zeke had to choose between saving Peter or witnessing him suffer the consequences for his past actions. Before Zeke could react, the game was already in motion. 
As two openings on the mechanical device in front of Peter lit up, glass bottles on the conveyor belt were being crushed inside the machine. The crushed glass is directly blown out by the strong wind. Peter can only use his back to withstand the damage caused by the glass shards. Faced with such a cruel punishment, Zeke decided to save Peter. He was going to take the rubbish bin in front of him as a cover. He didn't realize that the key to unlock the shackles was hidden here. Carrying the rubbish bin as cover, Zeke was about to use the key to open the shackles to save Peter, but it was too late. Peter was already dead. With Peter's death, the door to the next level opened. To Zeke's astonishment, William appeared before him. Finally, William revealed the truth behind everything. It turned out that the witness Peter had killed years ago was William's father. William had meticulously planned his entry into the police station to carry out his revenge and clean up the department, and the piece of tattooed skin was taken by William from the drug dealer and engraved on it. Even Zeke's father, Marcus, had been captured by William. While at the police station, William had found an excuse to borrow Zeke's phone. He used Zeke's phone to send a message to his father, luring him to this location. William targeted Zeke because he was the only person in the entire police force whom he considered upright and just. He used jigsaw-like mechanisms to punish these wicked individuals. Moreover, William invited Zeke to join him as an enforcer, to save his father's life. Zeke reluctantly agreed to join forces with William. William had one final test for Zeke. He picked up the phone and called the police, then fired several shots, informing them of a shooting at the location and urging them to hurry. To show his sincerity, William handed Zeke the gun. They proceeded to meet Marcus, Zeke's father. Marcus was suspended, his body filled with intravenous tubes, slowly draining his blood. Zeke, seeing this, pointed the gun at William and demanded he release his father. However, William informed Zeke that the only way to save his father was to use the single bullet left in the gun to hit the target above. If Zeke shot William, his father would be sacrificed. Due to the current rate of blood loss, Marcus had only three minutes before his life was in danger, but if Zeke chose to shoot the target, they could both survive. The police would be there soon, leaving little time for Zeke to decide. William revealed another shocking revelation about Marcus. It turned out that Marcus had secretly established clauses to protect the officers, allowing them to act with impunity and engage in dirty deeds. And Angie, who was his deputy at the time, was also involved in the planning of the clause. Faced with this difficult choice, Zeke chose to save his father. His father was released, and William prepared to escape. Marcus told Zeke to leave him alone and let Zeke capture William. Zeke rushed into the elevator and mercilessly beat William. As the police prepared to forcefully enter the room, the cutting machine accidentally severed the switch on the door. As the mechanical contraption inside the room was triggered, Marcus was once again suspended. When the police stormed in, they found Marcus hanging with a weapon in his hands. At that moment, Zeke quickly rushed out to intervene and was also subdued by the police. At that moment, the spotlight in the room suddenly turned on and shone on Marcus. Marcus' hand with the gun was forced up by the mechanism and aimed at the police. Faced with the threat of a weapon, the police made the decision to shoot, and Marcus died on the spot.